It's impossible for Becky Lynch to be a heel in the world of professional wrestling, or any world for that matter. If she'd been the one to throw Johnny Gargano headfirst into the TakeOver set, we'd all just assume that Johnny did something to deserve it. If Becky had insulted Seattle's 10 years of basketball inactivity, the fans in the Emerald City would have chanted, let's go thunder. Becky Lynch could shut down NXT and WWE Network, defraud several charities, bully her co-workers to tears, and change her Titantron video to one of those super sad Sarah McLachlan animal shelter commercials, and everybody would still cheer for her as though she'd saved the world from potential Martian conquerors. That's because it's utterly impossible to hate Becky, not even if she asked us to. If Becky said boomy or I'll spontaneously combust in 10 seconds, well, we'd certainly miss her, but there's absolutely no way we could do it. It's about time we honored Becky Lynch in list form, partially because she's more than deserving of being placed on the same pedestal as other wrestling icons, but mostly because it would get certain people to stop asking if we're going to do a list on Becky Lynch. Certain knit hat wearing lads with irregular hairstyles that may or may not be fixtures of niche wrestling YouTube channels, that is. Fear not specifically described internet personalities, your dreams have been answered. I'm Sam from Cultaholic.com and here are 10 things you didn't know about Becky Lynch. Join us! Number 10. Strong Arguments It's hard to imagine Becky Lynch being anything but a professional wrestler, given her robust performances and graceful athleticism in and out of the ring. Even after she started wrestling in her teenage years, Lynch wasn't certain about making her living as an eventual adult in the sport, and looked down other avenues in terms of her future. She would later attend University College Dublin before realizing that wrestling was, in fact, her passion. Before accepting wrestling as her life, one career path she strongly considered in her youth was becoming an attorney. Lynch considered herself good at debating people and added that she thought she'd enjoy the performance aspect of being a lawyer, performing in a manner of speaking before a judge and jury while arguing on behalf of a client. Of course, given that it's impossible to hate Becky as we've already touched on, it shouldn't have been too hard for her to sway any judge or jury in her favor, right? Number nine, a family affair. It's not unusual to see siblings get into wrestling. From Brett and Owen Hart to Matt and Jeff Hardy to both sets of Briscoes, be it Jack and Jerry or Jay and Mark, you could lose track of time trying to name as many examples of wrestling siblings as possible. Becky Lynch herself is one half of such an example, having a brother who made it into the business as well. Said brother would wrestle under the name Gonzo DiMondo, and he would join teenage Becky in receiving wrestling training beginning in the spring of 2002. According to most reliable sources, Gonzo DiMondo only lasted a few years in the business, with the comprehensive cage match internet wrestling database reporting that he ended his career in 2006. However, in the early part of his brief time in the business, he and Becky Becky worked together in mixed tag team bouts, each trying to cash in on their shared love of pro wrestling that dated back to watching it together as children. Number 8. Familiar Trainer When Becky and her brother sought out training in the spring of 2002, they traveled to the Irish coastal town of Bray, where a couple of young local wrestlers had opened up a school 90 minutes from her home. One of the trainers was a man named Paul Tracy, today a near 20-year veteran of the UK wrestling scene, that would also have a hand in training the likes of Killian Dane, Sean Guinness, and many others. Tracy's co-trainer is someone that isn't too far away from Becky today. In fact, he's only one brand over. Surely the mention of the city of Bray would have given away that Becky Lynch's other trainer was none other than Fergal Devitt, a man we know today as Finn Balor, who himself was only about 20 years old when he began teaching Lynch and her brother the ropes. Becky remembers there not being an actual ring earlier on in their training too, but instead just simple blue gym mats. Nonetheless, she made her in-ring debut five months later in 2002, just shy of her 16th birthday. Number 7. Wrestling as a Lifesaver You hear wrestlers all the time discuss what being in the business means to them. Many cite getting to perform for large groups of fans, or they'll say they get to live out their dream as lifelong fans themselves. These are both true for Becky Lynch, as she gets to satisfy both her fan side and her performer side every time she walks down the aisleway. But being in wrestling means something much deeper for Becky. In an interview conducted back in the mid-2000s, Lynch admitted that wrestling helped steer her away from bad habits in her youth, particularly excessive drinking in her early teenage years. Once she got into wrestling, Lynch claims she swore off those habits, dedicating herself to getting fit, adopting a healthier diet, and avoiding avoiding the vices that she said were only leading her down a bad path. Without wrestling at the time, saith Lynch, she's not sure where she would have ended up in life. Number 6. Crossing Paths Around the World Lynch worked her second WrestleMania match in 2017, taking part in a six-pack challenge for the SmackDown Women's Championship against Alexa Bliss, Mickey James, Naomi, Carmella, and Natalia. It certainly wasn't her first time sharing the ring with those women, in particular one Natty Neidhart, with whom Lynch had first shared a ring many, many moons ago. 
In November 2005, when Lynch was only 18 years old, she took part in an event at Corican Hall in Tokyo for the International Women's Grand Prix promotion. It was on that show that she would team with pre-WWE Natalia as well as a wrestler named Nikita, the future Katie Lee Birchill, in a six-woman tag. It's almost unfathomable that two young women's wrestlers would be in the same match at an event in Japan and then wind up at the same WrestleMania match 11 and a half years later, but it demonstrates just how strange pro wrestling can be at times. Number 5. Unusual Fight if Becky Lynch, Natalia, and Katie Lee Burchill working together in Japan more than a decade ago isn't weird enough for you, consider this seemingly random matchup. In September 2006, Lynch ventured to Italy where she would wrestle on each event of a three-night tour for a promotion called International Wrestling Zone. On the first night of the tour, Lynch competed in an intergender handicap match, teaming with Robbie Marino of CZW fame. Their opponent in that match? None other than Kevin Steen, aka Kevin Owens. It's odd enough that Kevin Owens once wrestled Becky Lynch, but that Becky would do so while teaming with the incredulous bystander from the oft-celebrated John Zandig JESUS video. If ever there was a hidden gem for WWE to somehow get their hands on, it would have to be this one. Plus, who knows, maybe the nostalgia conjured up by seeing Robbie Moreno on the WWE Network could bring us closer to the Zandig vs Dean Ambrose match we've all just wanted to see so deep down inside of us. Number 4. Walking Away By 2006, Lynch had established herself as a special presence between the ropes while working under the name Rebecca Knox. Her work in Shimmer Women's Athletes demonstrated her cultured skill between the ropes, as matches with the likes of Alice in Danger and Daisy Hayes, particularly a 30-minute 2 out of 3 falls match with Hayes, showed that Becky was years ahead of her time. But her meteoric rise would soon meet a disheartening detour. In September 2006, Lynch suffered a serious head injury while wrestling in Germany, causing potential damage to one of her cranial nerves. The injury, which caused headaches and blurred vision, scrapped a 60-minute Iron Woman rematch with Hayes, and in fact, Lynch would pretty much give up on wrestling for close to seven years, save for three matches in that stretch. While away from wrestling, Lynch worked as an actress and as a flight attendant before getting back into the game in 2013, signing a developmental deal with WWE. Number 3. Long-Term Connections Thursday night, November 7th, 2013 marked the first time that Becky Lynch would wrestle in a WWE-owned ring, taking part in an NXT Live event in Tampa, Florida. Lynch's first official match as a WWE-signed performer was of the tag team variety, teaming with future NXT ring announcer and backstage interviewer Veronica Lane. Although Lane would leave the business within a year of that match, her and Becky's two opponents would each make a mark on the main WWE roster, comparable to that of the Irish last kicker. Those two opponents were none other than Bailey and Paige. Becky's connection with Bailey would swell into WWE's version of the Four Horsewomen alongside Charlotte Flair and Sasha Banks, though she already had a history with Paige. Lynch had wrestled Paige's mother, Soraya Knight, on multiple occasions and had also managed both Soraya and Paige, then known as Brittany Knight, in Shimmer in 2011. Seven years later, that same Brittany Knight would become Becky's kayfabe boss on SmackDown Live. Number 2. What's in a name? Becky's disarm her finisher is a simple but effective hold, in that it doesn't require a convoluted application and it looks downright painful. Lynch would later credit Goldust with helping her learn the hold, but it wasn't him that helped name it. You'd think the puntastic Lynch would have come up with the disarmer, disarm her wordplay herself, but it was a now former WWE superstar who invented the name. That wrestler would be former Vaude villain member Simon Gotch. Lynch noted in a 2017 interview with Sports Kida that Gotch is quite the wordsmith himself and he helped her out while she was trying to think of a name for the seated armbar. Interestingly, both Lynch and Gotch have connections to professional mixed martial artists, as Lynch for a time dated Nashville-born bantamweight Cool Hand Luke Sanders, while Gotch's post-WWE life has seen him tag-teaming with the charismatic, filthy Tom Lawler in promotions such as Major League Wrestling. And number one, Forever Blue. In the 2016 WWE draft that populated Raw and SmackDown for the second brand split, Lynch was selected 14th overall by Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan to be on the Blue Huge show. Ever since she was picked, Lynch has been a fixture on Tuesday night, never having crossed over to Raw in any sort of shakeup. Of the 14 wrestlers that were selected by SmackDown on the televised portion of the draft, only three have remained on SmackDown this entire time. Becky, along with AJ Styles and Randy Orton. Lynch is also one of three females 
picked by SmackDown overall to have remained on the brand all this time, joining Naomi and Carmella in that regard. Given how much the shows have changed in the 2017 and 2018 superstar shakeups, and how people like John Cena have these magical free agency clauses that allow them immunity, it's rarer to see a talent as valuable as Lynch remain on one show all this time. But it makes sense. If SmackDown is the less hateable show of the two brands, then the least hateable wrestler should be one of its centerpieces. And that's our list. I've been Sam from Cultaholic.com. You can follow me on Twitter here. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic. If you like what we do here at Cultaholic, you can check us out on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And no matter what you do, don't ever forget to hit subscribe and join us.